was, you know, at the age of 16, after all my encounters with current physics and so on, I decided I was done. And it's great because I just went to the Einstein exhibit in New York and found out that Einstein did the exact same thing and quit school at 16. But um, I was, uh, you know, I, I couldn't keep doing this. I was just running into troubles everywhere I went. And so I started to teach skiing. Because I was a good skier, I figured I can live that way and do research at night. So I was doing research at night and skiing every day, teaching skiing, being in nature. And I was like, well, you know, after years of skiing, I, I taught skiing for 15 years. I became one of the top ski instructors in Canada. I was one of the 20 top ski instructor in Canada, ski coach. And I was very successful. And I was going from Canada to Australia, New Zealand in the summer to do their ski season there, and then back to Canada, and then back to Australia, and then back to Canada, and I was freezing my butts out. <laughs> I had no time to unfreeze. I had like a week and a half to two weeks on, you know, Fiji Island, you know, uh, in between seasons. And I was just not cutting it. So after a while of doing that, I got tired of it, and one summer I said, that's it, I ain't teaching skiing again this summer. I'm going to teach scuba diving. <laughs> so I am you know, decided to thaw out one summer and teach scuba diving. And I had, taught, I had been scuba diving since I was a young kid. So I knew I could teach scuba diving. So I, went, I opened a map and I thought, okay, I've got to be south of the border. It's got to be extremely hot. And uh, so I, I took a map of, of, of Mexico and I found this little island called Isla Mujeres. And I thought, wow, you know, I was a ski instructor at Island of the Women. Man. That sounds good to me. So I decided I went to, that I was going to go to Isla Mujeres. So uh, I went down there and I got a job as a, as a dive master and I started to, you know, uh, dive master down there and I learned a lot and all this and then one day I had a day off and I decided to go for a little expedition and I hadn't seen the pyramids so I decided to go to teach Tichin Itza the pyramids of Tichin Itza well you know it's like you get in the bus you know I had to take the ferry from the island I got in the bus you know with the chickens and the pigs and everything <laughs> And I'm going through the jungle, you know, for hours. And then finally, you, you see these pyramids sticking out of the jungle in the middle of nowhere. And it's like, huh? And they're like these huge monuments. And I get onto the, onto the site and I'm walking around and I'm like going, wow, how'd this get here? So I'm climbing on top of the pyramid and... The, you know, I figure I meditate on it, so I'm sitting down, I'm trying to meditate, and sure enough, as soon as I close my eyes, you know, I hear, you know, a group of tourists coming off the stairs on the other side with a tour guide. I'm like, listening, you know, trying to meditate, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I'm listening to this tour guide, and the tour guide is saying how you know, all the rocks were cut in the quarry over the mountain range we see in the distance, and that they were carried from there, cut with copper tools, and then carried from there on vine, with vine ropes on logs across the mountains, across the jungle, <laughs> you know, down the mountains, into Chichen Itza, and then assembled into this amazing monument we were in standing on. I'm listening to this and I'm going, really? And then he and then he mentioned that actually the monument was actually carved and cut perfectly so that on the solstice every year, the sun when the sun rises, it casts a shadow of a snake going up the stairways and the snake head is carved on the bottom and, and it really works. 
and I'm listening to this and I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. These people like thousands of years ago were going around with huge stones across jungle, across mountain range, right? And like putting them in this perfect building that's amazingly well aligned to astrolo astronomical events. And it's not like he can build the pyramid and then like get Joe out there and get, okay, Joe, the sun is rising now. Okay, okay, pick it up now. Okay, a little bit to the left. You can't do that. You got to calculate that stuff in advance. And those are not simple calculations. Those are very complex. Just happens that most of these buildings we find around the world are pyramidal. Those, most of these enigmatic buildings are pyramidal and most of them are aligned with incredible accuracy to astronomical events. So as I was listening to this, and I'm a climber as well, and I know rock, and I know that you can't cut rock with copper. <laughs> and I find out later on that archaeologists say, oh well, they had a way to temper the copper so it became hard. And I was like, okay, can anybody else do that? <laughs> no. You mean that with all the millions of dollars that are invested in research in metallurgy, Nobody is able to harden copper, but the ancient people thousands of years ago could do it. The other thing is that, have you ever tried to pull rocks on logs in the jungle <laughs> with vine ropes? And now, you're talking about people that didn't have the pulley. So now you've got to stack these rocks to make your pyramid without a pulley. Uh, that didn't sound right to me. Uh, just because I'm a type of a logical person. And I was standing on top of this pyramid kind of scratching my head going, Oh my God, that, that, that doesn't sound right. There's got to be some mystery we're missing here. And then it hit me. He's like, wait a minute. This is a pyramid. And there's pyramids all around the world from these ancient civilizations. Why were they all building the exact same geometry? Why didn't they make a cube? You know, why didn't they, you know, what's going on? What's with this pyramidal thing? And I thought, okay, maybe this is a long shot but maybe they knew something about the fundamental structure of the vacuum. Maybe they knew something about the logos of reality, the fundamental structure from which everything emerges. And maybe pyramids are involved in that. So when I got back home, at the time I lived at Whistler, Canada, a big ski hill, I went to my local library. Well, you know, in a ski resort, a uh, library is not, you know, so elaborate. Uh, but I was looking for information about ancient civilization, and the first book I came across uh, w was titled Mystery of um, the Mexican Pyramid by Peter Tompkins. And I thought, oh, that's a good title. Definitely is a mystery there. And I opened it randomly, if there is such a thing. And when I did, this graphic, this is not my graphic, this graphic was on the page. A tetrahedron within a sphere. Well, I had spent by then, 
a very long time coming up with the idea that the tetrahedron and the sphere must be part of the geometry of reality. And it was the base of my theory. And to find this in a book that talked about ancient knowledge was crazy. I'm like, oh my God, they beat me to it by 2,000 years. <laughs> Dang, I was going to copyright this. <laughs> and like, oh, what's that doing there? And, you know, there was a whole elaboration about the relationship of a tetrahedron to a sphere, showing that a tetrahedron has a very interesting relationship to the sphere, where it intersects the sphere at exactly two-thirds down, one-thirds up, if one point is on the south, or if one...